My name is Mark Thompson. I'm a journalist and an advocate in media for animal rights. Thank you. But I must tell you, I am a bit intimidated and uh, honored to be moderating this panel with this remarkable group. Nathan Runkle, the founder of Mercy for Animals. Ingrid Newkirk, the founder and president of PETA. And Mark Ching, the founder of the Animal Hope and Wellness Foundation and an international dog rescuer. It's, it's cool, everybody's obviously coming from the same direction, but you can see even in this panel, there are people here who are coming from directions that are a bit more specific than others. I speak of Mark, for example, who goes all the way over to Asia and rescues animals there and has brought a kind of awareness to the dog and cat meat market in Asia that I don't think we had 10 years ago in this country. So I think that's a, a real victory. And PETA also, a very noisy organization through years, you know, the <laughs> most inventive protests. And, it, you know, sometimes you gotta be noisy to get your message across. And the undercover videos that come out of Mercy for Animals, the, uh, the attention that's brought to factory farming that way. But the idea of animal rescue as a social justice movement is one of the things that we are addressing on this panel. And I guess we'll just start, I'm closest to city, and we'll just go on down the line. Uh, how does animal rights fit into the social justice consciousness and as a, as a movement, how does it move forward from here? Well, to me, animal rights is the social justice movement of our time, certainly of our generation. And if we look at, you can clap, you can clap as much as you want for this panel especially when I'm speaking. <laughs> if, you, if you look at the number of individuals that are suffering and that are being exploited and who have no control over their own bodies, their own lives, their own futures. <laughs> yeah, there she is, fashionably right. late, always Cat making Bondi. an appearance. <laughs> okay. Kat, welcome, we're just finishing up. I'm so sorry for being late. It's great to have you here. We're just talking about the different, the, the movement, the animal activism, as it fits into a social justice movement. So that's what Nathan's talking about cool. right now. That's right. So if you, if you look at the numbers, in the U.S. alone, almost 300 animals are killed every single second. And if you think about this movement, it is different in the fact that as opposed to past social justice movements, those who are being exploited, those who are being abused, they can't sit up here on stage and share their stories with people. They can't boycott products. They can't lobby Congress. So it is different in the sense that those who are weak and vulnerable need us, those in places of power, to speak up on their behalf. And thankfully, we're really starting to move towards a tipping point on this issue, a generational shift, and that's very exciting. Ingrid, have you noticed that, uh, that this generation seems more receptive to the idea? Well, as the doddery old person here... <laughs> I, but we have the same I, outfits. I, yes, we do. <laughs> and from the same thrift shop, I'm That's told. That's right. Is, um, I can't help but notice it. When we started, which is 37 years ago, we did the very first undercover investigation. Nobody had thought you could do anything about the plight of animals in laboratories. We got the first conviction, felony conviction, for cruelty on factory farms. And nobody talked about vegan. Vegan was somebody from Las Vegas. <laughs> so um, I've seen enormous change. If you had told me then that you could walk into a supermarket and not just have one non-dairy milk, but this whole range of them, I'd have thought you were on hallucinogenics. <laughs> So, yes, but the thing is, we've got to keep the momentum going. That's more important than anything else, is that you go forward, you mustn't let it slide. So it's not good enough for us to change and to be happy at seeing change, is that we have to make change happen. We can't be that fly on the chariot wheel saying, look at it going around, you have to make it go around. So we have to make it far bigger than it is now, far, far bigger. Yes. Mark, I feel as though your effort started maybe as a, a kind of a one-man effort, and it became part of the social justice movement. Is that more or less right? 
Uh, well, first of all, I don't even know how I'm on this panel with these people. Uh, I'm just like this regular guy. And like, what I'm doing here, I don't know, but... <laughs> you know, when I first started, I wasn't vegan. And because I work in healthcare, a lot of my clients were vegan, or a lot of the people I knew were vegan, and they were pushing me to become vegan, but I wasn't vegan. And until I bore witness, meaning walk onto the kill floor of a slaughterhouse, I wasn't vegan. And now that I do what I do, I go undercover just like how Nathan's group does or any other group. And I see the most craziest things that human beings are doing to animals. And you talk about the next social justice movement, and it's true because those are the most oppressed species on Earth. Nothing is hurt more or tortured more or ridiculed more than animals. And we started as just me, and now we've grown to be so much more, and not just because of my efforts, but because of social media and the awareness that it gives us and sharing the videos of these animals who really are the true heroes to stand up every day on that slaughterhouse kill floor line and take it. And hopefully in the end, things are changing, even though sometimes it's hard to see, but. The images of dogs and cats that fill the different undercover videos that you're involved with, Mark, I feel that generally they resonate with the people who aren't involved in the movement first because people love dogs and cats. They don't necessarily see the global issue of animal rights. They see dogs and cats being oppressed. How do you bridge that? Or is that just part of generally making people aware? You know, when I started, I was just rescuing dogs and I didn't realize, uh, it sounds stupid, but I didn't realize that another species like a chicken or a fish had feelings or could feel pain. And so I was like most of what we would call modern America where we have pets and they live in our families so we are so emotional about them. We take a lot of criticism because I go undercover and I document the boiling of dogs, the burning of them. But somebody else can do it to a chicken and it's different. But it, it's really not. I was just at this event not too long ago and I, it was a dog event that spoke about Yulin. And at this event, I opened up talking about my recent trip that I just got back two weeks ago. And I was in Cambodia on this kill floor. And they had this baby cow next to the mother cow. And then they took the reins off the baby cow, this rope, and dragged them to the kill floor. And the mother was going crazy. And she had this ring in her nose that kept her from getting there, and I thought she was gonna rip off her face because she was so disturbed and so upset that they were gonna take her child from her, and then they killed her, the baby. And they came back for the mother, and they walked her out there, and usually when you're gonna die, you're fighting for your life. But it's so strange because she walked out there, and because of my father, I can tell you, it's like she gave up and he smashed her in the head and she fell on her legs and she got back up strong how I believe I would do for my own children. And they hit her and hit her and hit her. And I posted this video because the people who follow us, they are not vegan, most of them. So they could know that a dog is not special and that cow had the same feelings that I would or my wife would when your child is taken away. And if they killed my children, I would walk there on, that, on the floor of that slaughterhouse and I would have done the same thing. I would have held my fear inside and I would have took that sledgehammer in the head and I would have fell on my legs and got up as many times as I could for my child. And so, Mark, before you move on to Kat. <laughs> may I just say that 
That is so moving because Mark came from the place most people do, which is, as you said, love of dogs and cats, and then the gate drops, that's it. But I would like to just remind people what you know is that we've done undercover video of dog slaughter in China for leather. And when people are thinking about going vegan, they have to think about clothing and we can help them. When we showed that and said these dogs are being killed to make jacket trim and gloves and so on, we actually got Michelin, the car company, who would have thought of this, that used 1.5 million leather gloves on its factory floor every year because of members writing to switch to 1.5 non-leather gloves because dogs are often in leather gloves. And you know, Mark, that story also reflects not only the bridge between the cat and dog markets to the general horror that is farming of animals, but uh, a story that's played out over and over in dairy farms everywhere, as you know, and, and the uh, calves are taken away from the mothers because the only way they can produce that milk, as you all know, is to, is to be pregnant. And so the veal industry exists as sort of a, a twin of the, or, or in this de death dance with the, uh, with the dairy industry. Yet another reason to be vegan, to push away from, from cheese. Kat, um, Kat Von D, you have a whole line of cruelty, uh, a whole cruelty-free line. A and I'm wondering, yeah, I think that's... Yes. And I'm wondering, as you move into this world of social activism uh, in, in such a big way, what things do people respond to the most? Huh, well, um... I mean, it's kind of interesting. Well, it's really interesting to me. When I first started the makeup line 10 years ago, I was not yet vegan. Um, I wasn't even sober. <laughs> and, um, and, then, and then I did become sober, and I feel that that was my first step into conscious living, you know? Uh, I couldn't hide behind uh, being a booze hound. Um, and the, you start seeing things clearer, and, uh, and then I think at that point I was much more receptive to, you know, all my actions and how they affect other things. And, um, and so, uh, you know, veganism, when it fell in front of my lap, I was pretty resistant to it. And then, uh, but then the more and more I learned about it, of course, it was like, oh yeah, I wanna, um, I wanna, I don't wanna just talk the talk, you know, and say I'm a good person. I actually wanna be one. And, uh, and, 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 and I found it to be like a real big blessing in the sense that I, um, out of my ignorance of, you know, starting a, a makeup line, not even knowing that we also exploit animals when we're creating cosmetics, uh, which is, totally awful, um, it, it, it kind of created this opportunity for me to like lead by example. So it's like, you know, the bigger the brand became, uh, the more it was important for me to voice this message of living a cruelty-free life. And so, um, you know, a lot of brands have uh, the, the label cruelty-free on them, which means technically that they, they don't test on animals. But to me, I think that if you're killing animals, uh, and using them as ingredients, that's cruel too. So I think veganism is actually cruelty-free. Um, you know, it, it, go, it falls under the same category. So I ended up having to reformulate things. And uh, it cost us money and time and effort. Uh, my development team probably hated me that year. But, uh, but now, pretty much my entire creative team and development team is vegan as well. And they're all here too, and they're excited. Woo! So, the, the cool thing is, is like, when I look at, you know, from a marketing standpoint or as a business owner, uh, you look at numbers and, um, and, and the dynamics of how consumers, which I hate that word, but, you know, the client, uh, how they're shopping nowadays, it's really interesting and it's actually um, gives me a lot of hope because the number one reason that people are purchasing now is, believe it or not, is caring. That's, that's what came up in everybody's, uh, you know, before it used to be, you know, uh, whatever's fashionable or the celebrities wearing something, they don't care anymore. Like, for them, it's like if, if you have a story behind it and it's actually doing something that's, whether it's good for the environment or for animals or for yourself, like, that, that's what people are. So I think, like, the biggest marketing, marketing advice I could give to all my competitors is, like, take that vegan dollar. Even if you don't care about animals, like, be a part of it in whatever way. Like, you're gonna benefit, the, the planet benefits, we all benefit. And so, um, but, um, sorry, I'm gonna try not to ramble because I know we don't have that much time, but to tie it back into all of 
to, to veganism, because I think that when you look at even, you know, on a scale of like how many animals are dying in like the lab tests, uh, the laboratories, it's so small compared to obviously factory farming. But to me, I've always felt like that something as simple as a lipstick is like the gateway drug <laughs> to um, being living a, com a conscious, compassionate life. Uh, I've noticed a lot of my followers on Instagram who are not vegan and have like switched all their makeup over to being cruelty free, they start being a, a lot more receptive to the idea of possibly cutting out, you know, meat, dairy, and eggs, and and, to, and and then from there on, you know, they become vegan and, the, and then they're here now too. And, um, and we get to celebrate all this together and fight for it together. So I think that every, every step counts, you know, and, um, and in a world where social media is so influential and um, it really gives every single person a platform and, and, you know, everybody can take reign of their own power and their own influence. And uh, we, shouldn't, we shouldn't take that for granted, you know. So, so I think, you know, like, like you said earlier, like some days I'm, I'm like, fuck, we're just fighting this uphill battle. And it's like hard, you know, I went to a factory farm for the first time and, ha had, and I haven't talked about it yet because um, I'm still actually processing that stuff and, I'd, and I'm, I don't think I'm ready yet. But... You know, some days I just want to just give up and just call it a day. But then, um, but then I think about something that you said last year at Circle V, which was about how every time that you um, feel hesitant about speaking up, you think about specific animals, and I, I do that too. And I think about like, you know what? Like, um, I'm gonna like let go of my ego or my pride or my fear and go ahead and stand up for what's right. I would want somebody to do that for me. We know where you live, so don't you dare give uh -huh. up. We'll come get you. <laughs> It's interesting to hear you say that the caring part of that business is the thing that brought in the most business, and that's really a kind of part of this social justice movement. What's most effective as a message to people who aren't already on board with this movement, or maybe even aware of the movement? And this is a great panel for that. Uh, tell me, what's most effective? You hear oftentimes, uh, don't talk about the animals, because people don't give a shit about animals. Talk about the health concerns, you know. Uh, but then I also hear, no, 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 people are really moved by the plight of the animals. Show them the animals. And I find on social media people say, wow, that video you posted got me to go vegan. What is the thing that you find has been most successful? Well, I think it varies from person to person. People care about different things, but I think especially if we look at young people who aren't thinking about cancer and heart disease, it is compassion. And if we're able to say, you love your dog, you love your cat, they're members of your family, you know that they have unique personalities and minds and needs and interests, farm animals are exactly the same. The only difference is our perception of them. That's it. So I think compassion and ethics is what makes diet change really stick. And that can open the floodgates for people to start eating a healthier diet, um, et cetera. So, that's why Mercy for Animals really focuses on the fact that we're eating someone, not something, that our food choices have consequences, and we can choose kindness over cruelty every time that we sit down to eat. This is an issue that we cannot be neutral on, we cannot be bystanders on, we either are supporting animal cruelty or we're supporting compassion. So empowering people to know that just ma making small changes in their diet, it can spare dozens of animals every year. That message is really resonating with people, especially young people. There's a study done recently that found that 1% of baby boomers are vegetarian, 4% of Gen Xers, but 12% of millennials. So there is no doubt the trajectory uh, of veganism. I find that justice is a very strong motivator because we all want to be decent people, don't we? We all want to be kind people. We want to be the sort of people we think we are. And so giving people choices in every facet of their lives, but tying it back to the principle that if you're against violence, if you're against discrimination, exploitation, oppression, then... We got Tanner for a second. <laughs> You are for animal rights. Animal rights isn't a separate thing. 
And these days, I mean, women are struggling. Right now, there's a wonderful initiative going on to really tip the tables against what has been going on since the beginning of time. This is a very important time for women. <laughs> Civil rights. At the moment, it's sort of overshadowed by what's happening with women, but Black Lives Matter and all the things that are happening for civil rights are huge. And this isn't separate. What we say all the time is, don't be afraid to call rape, rape. The victim's identity isn't important. If it happens to a dairy cow, it happens anywhere, happens to me, it's rape. So call it what it is. <laughs> one movement, one movement, indivisible. Women's rights, children's rights, rights for the elderly, civil rights, disability rights, animal rights, one movement for social justice. And we should boldly say it and show why that's true. The principle of rights is what, and justice is what should prevail. Yeah, Mar Mark, I see these are two people who are running organizations that handle sort of a uh, a huge aspect of animal rights across the board. Certainly PETA deals with all kinds of uh, abuse to animals and mercy for animals. Uh, essentially the same thing, maybe focused on factory farming in large, in large measure. Uh, how, do you, how do you fit into this movement as, uh, as someone who's had great success, both uh, personally, but also in terms of building momentum? Well, first of all, there's never success because, you know, we're nothing and the animals are dying. Uh, but to speak about that, a lot of people don't know, but I go undercover into everything. On my last trip, uh, we started going into laboratories that they test on animals. And because I have no brain, I actually did a Facebook Live in one of these laboratories. <laughs> and then we spent time going into fur farms in Finland and China. And still yet, because I have no brain, we did a Facebook Live in these places so people can see the truth of what's happening behind the wall. Uh, to talk about the question that you asked <clears throat> about like... Well, actually, you've uh, kind of addressed it because what you're saying essentially is that you've broadened your perspective. Originally, it was the dog and cat rescue and dog meat trade, but it sounds to me like you've sort of brought an increasing awareness. Maybe it was your own curiosity, I don't know what, but toward toward fur farms and a, and a number of things that sort of don't fall into the original category that you were part of? Well, when I became vegan, that did it when I realized that everything mattered. Uh, and the movement we represent, which is no different from anybody here, we started doing something that I didn't even know it was called until I met this lady named Anita who runs a group called Toronto Pig Save. And I went to Toronto maybe about a year and a half ago for my first vigil. And when I was there, she spoke to me about a concept called bearing witness. And in my opinion, and for the people that I'm close with, in my heart, that is the most influential thing you can do to save animals and turn people vegan. And so when I go on these trips, I document as much as I can and I post these videos and I write about it. And it's the truth in what is happening that is changing people to become aware and conscious. When they see that cow or when they see that dog or when they see that pig, it's so powerful and so moving. A few weeks ago, I think it was just last week, I did a before and after of this dog named Happy. Uh, he's from a meat market in China, and they cut all her feet off, cut her ear off, cut her tail off, broke her nose. And when we rescued her, she was trembling and shaking, and I took a lot of criticism on why I didn't put her down. And on one of these feeds on my post, I had just said, wait until you see in two and a half months. And two and a half months had passed, and I posted what she looks like today. And that was so powerful and it's so moving. And it's a concept that when people see the atrocity, they're outraged. And that is what changes 
regular human beings like myself into being active. And so, in my opinion, it's bearing witness and sharing the stories. A lot of times, people comment that they can't watch it. If I have to be there in person, or if an undercover investigator has to live their life in this condition and document it, but if that animal has to die, it's our responsibility to see it and to share it. Because in the end, that is what is going to bring about liberation, and that is what will save the most lives. And anyways. <laughs> and, and so that is what Mercy for Animals does, and PETA, and every group that's going undercover who are, who are killing themselves emotionally just to defend the most oppressed species on earth. And so... So use the videos, please. Use share the videos, please. Share, please. Them, share, share them, them. share them, share please. them. And a lot of undercover investigators do suffer PTSD. It's not at all uncommon. It can be the kind of thing that can have reverberations throughout their lives. Um, our time, I know we have two minutes. It seems so unfair. What's that? Yeah, I, I, I wanted to get to uh, Kat quickly just to ask what you had. You a have what? two minutes. I wouldn't even bother because I'm Kat, gonna... <laughs> No, Kat, I, 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 because I quickly here in the last uh, couple of minutes, I'd like to just get a word or two about moving forward. Uh, as you see it, you've seen momentum in your product line, as you say, people caring so much. What's the best way to communicate a message to those, again, not in the movement, moving forward. We've made such progress, but it feels as though we've got a long way to go. Um, hmm. Well, I mean, oh, God. I could write a book about <laughs> or this. Or anything else you want to talk about, Kat? <laughs> yeah, no, no. Um, uh, I can start up here, too, if you'd prefer. <laughs> no, you know, like, um, my approach has changed uh, actually quite recently. I think uh, uh, I'm quite emotional, and when I'm passionate about something, I'm extra loud about it. And, uh, and sometimes that can, you know, depending on who you're talking to, that might turn people off. So I don't think there's, like, one specific way of doing it. Like, what I love about following PETA, Mercy for Animals, Farm Sanctuary, Animal Equality, I follow all of you guys on, on, on uh, Twitter, Instagram. Because and we follow you. What? And we follow you. I know. You, you, you liked my video. and said, coming to Circle V, guys. But um, no, but the, 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 what I love about it is that there's, you know, something for everyone. Um, there's, there's so many things that are going on in this world that, are, uh, that need help. And I think that there's dif different avenues. And I think that, you know, where, where Mercy for Animals doesn't focus on animal testing, I think PETA does an excellent job on that. You know, like, so it's like I, I'm able to repost everybody. And so, so I think, um, yeah, I think there's different ways depending on who you're talking to. If I'm talking to somebody who's all they care about is makeup and vanity, like, I, I'll tell you, like, when I cut out dairy, my skin never looked... <laughs> better, you know? So if that's the selling point, that'll be the selling point. Like, if, if I'm talking to somebody who loves, who, lo who rescues dogs, you know, I have so many friends that are not vegan and that they, like, have pit bull rescues and stuff, and it's like, well, then I'm going to talk about animals, you know, or I'm going to talk about, come at that angle, you know? And I think, I think it's just all about, like, having empathy for whoever you're speaking to and talking to people on their level. I, that's how I like to be talked to. Um, and, and yeah, so um, I guess I'll close it up by saying that this year I read a really great book called, um, and I'll probably butcher the title, but I think it's How to Create a Vegan Planet or Vegan World by Tobias. And it really changed my perspective on how sometimes I tend to bark at people about things. Um, and how some things are more effective than others. And it, it helped me uh, better understand so that I, my delivery of message actually is more effective. And so yeah, if you guys wanna Google that, um, I'm sure I messed up the title, but, um, but it, it was actually a really, a really great book to read. I feel that there are a lot of uh, pieces of great information that can be used in communicating the message of animal rights at all of these websites. I mean, really, I pick up little things, I go, God, I'm gonna use that, you know, from PETA, from MFA, whatever. I, I, but what, what Ingrid said about sharing a video, I think, is something I walk away from this today. I'm gonna be more aggressive about sharing videos. Uh, we're out of time, and, I, and, and I'm sick about it, because I <laughs> could talk to you all. Uh, but thank you all for spending a moment with us. Uh, thank you all for being here for Circle V, second year. See you next year. One thing.
one thing. One more word from one Ingrid. One more word from this blabbermouth. She always please. has to have the last word, well, Ingrid. No, you can have the last word, but I have to say, please, 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 not everybody is as clever as Kat or as a business person or make something special, but everybody has their voice. Every single person here is vital. Please use it. Don't let your life go by without using it. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Yes, get involved in any way. Use your unique scout talents and skills. See you guys Here's outside with the music. Ingrid Newkirk, Mark Ching, Kat Bundy. Thank you, everyone.